Hello, my friends. We're here with the next installment of our chapter book that we're reading together, Wish Tree by Catherine Applegate. When we left off, we are on chapter 12 now. In case you would happen to have a copy of the book at home and want to read along, but we're on chapter 12. By this time, the lanky boy had walked past me. Remember, this is Red, the tree, who's narrating the story. Swiveled and returned. Glancing over his shoulder, he stepped into the brown lawn that blanketed my roots. The air changed, quivering the way it will when people are near, with chemicals, pulsing heat, humanness. And then it happened. He dug into my trunk with the object in his hand, fast, deliberate. Again, he checked his surroundings. An elderly woman crossing the street smiled at him and shook her head. She was probably thinking, oh, how sweet. I'll bet he's carving a heart with initials in it. Oh, to be young and in love. People are under the impression that trees don't mind being carved into, especially if hearts are involved. For the record, we mind. I'd never seen the boy before. He was big, maybe a high schooler. It's hard to know with people. With a tree, I can sense to the month, sometimes to the day, its age. I couldn't tell what he was carving, of course, but I could tell from the determined way he moved that it was meant to hurt. Not me. Sometime, somehow I sensed it wasn't meant to hurt me. I was just his canvas. That said, it's not exactly a picnic getting hacked into. Bark is my skin, my protection from the world. Any wound makes it harder to fight off disease and insects. I wanted to yell, stop, to say something, anything. But of course I didn't. It's not our way. Trees are meant to listen to observe, to endure. He was done quickly. He stood back, admired his work, gave a little nod, and left. As he walked away, I saw the tool clutched in his fist, a little screwdriver with a yellow handle, thin as a twig, bright as a meadow lark. Chapter 13. Bongo was the first to see what had happened. She landed at the base of my trunk, head cocked, dropping the potato chip in her beak. She cried, I leave you alone for a few minutes and look what happens. What on earth? It seems someone mistook me for a pumpkin, I said. When she didn't smile, I added, because, you know, I was carved. For the millionth time, Red, explaining doesn't make things any funnier. Bongo flew to my lowest scaffold branch, one of my big primary limbs. She examined my injury. Does it hurt? Not the way an injury might hurt you. Trees are different that way. I gotta do something, Bongo said. There's nothing to be done. You've got a major boo-boo. I want to help. You're the wise old tree. Tell me what to do. Really, Bongo, time heals all wounds. Bongo hates it when I philosophize. She rolled her eyes. At least I think she did. It's hard to tell with crows. Their eyes are like morning blackberries, dark and dewy. I just hope my bark isn't ruined, I said. That's my favorite side. It's not ruined, just decorated, like those tattoos people get. Bongo nudged me with her beak. Show me who did this. I'll get him. I'll squawk at his window in the middle of the night. I'll dive bomb him and yank out some hair. She flapped her wings. No, no, better yet, I'll make a deposit on his head. I'll make a deposit on his head every day for a year. I didn't ask what kind of deposit. I was quite sure I knew. Bongo, dear, I said, that won't be necessary. 
Bongo shifted from foot to foot, something she did when she was working out a problem. You know, she said, it's almost time for wishing day. Maybe this is some kind of wish, just a poorly delivered one. Another wishing day, I repeated. It seemed like we just had one. Had a whole year already come and gone? Days have a way of slipping past like raindrops in a river. One more round, Bongo said, of greedy people bugging you with their needs. One more round of hopeful people wishing for better things, I corrected. Wishing day was always a bit hard on me and on my residents. Usually the animals and birds stayed away that day to avoid curious hands and endless photographs. But it was just one day. I understood its history and my role in it. I knew people were full of longings. A mother tugging a toddler along the sidewalk froze in place when she saw my trunk. Mommy, what does that say? asked her little girl, who was clutching a stuffed toy dog by its bedraggled tail. The mother didn't answer. Mommy? They crossed the lawn. The mother stepped close to me. It says, leave, she finally said. Like trees have leaves. Gently, the mother traced my cuts with her index finger. Maybe, she answered, may maybe like that. She looked over at the two houses near me. Shaking her head, she tightened her grip on the little girl's hand. Let's hope that's all it means. Chapter 14 Those houses. My houses. One painted blue, one painted green, one with a black door, one with a brown door, one with a yellow mailbox, one with a red mailbox. For well over a century, I had stared at them. Prim and proper, same size, small, same boxy shape, same pitched roofs and squat black chimneys. Architectural siblings. Long before they were a glimmer in some builder's eye, I was here, right in the middle of things. If my roots stretched past the property line that separated them, well, that's never been my concern. Roots can be unruly. Mine explored the earth below both houses, pirouetted around their plumbing, anchored their foundations. I spread my shade fairly. I dropped my leaves evenly. I bombed their roofs with acorns in equal numbers. I did not play favorites. Over the years, many families had called those houses home. Babies and teenagers, grandparents and great-grandparents. They spoke Chinese and Spanish, Yoruba and English and French Creole. They ate tamales and pani puri, dim sum and fufu and grilled cheese sandwiches. Different languages, different food, different customs. That's our neighborhood. Wild and tangled and colorful, like the best kind of garden. A few months ago, a new family, Samar's family, rented the blue house. They were from a distant country. Their ways were unfamiliar. Their words held new music. Just another transplant in our messy garden, it seemed. Except at that time, something changed. The air was uneasy. The parents in the greenhouse refused to welcome the new family. There were polite nods between the adults at first, but then even those vanished. Other things happened. Someone threw raw eggs at the blue house. One afternoon, a car passed by, filled with angry men yelling angry things. Things like, Muslims, get out! Sometimes, Samar would walk home, trailed by children, taunting her. I love people dearly. And yet, 
216 rings and I still haven't figured them out. Our neighborhood had welcomed many families from far away. What was different this time? The headscarf Samar's mother wore? Or was it something else? All this unfolded busybody that I am, I kept tabs, eavesdropped, observed. I never interfered. Trees are impartial observers. We are the strong and silent type. Besides, what could I possibly do? I had limbs, but they could merely sway. I had a trunk, but it was rooted to the earth. I had a voice, but it could not be used. My resources were limited. So, too, as it turned out, was my patience. I think that's where we're going to leave it for tonight. Some kind of an angry word there. And we're not exactly sure what's going on in this neighborhood. But I think we'll find out in the coming days. Let's have a prayer. Jesus, you came into the world and there were people that were welcoming you and there were people that were angry. As it turned out, there were people that wanted you to stay and people that wanted you to leave. Help us to look to all people and welcome them as we once welcomed you. Amen. Now, it's really time. You better have your jams on. I hope you washed your hands and face and brushed your teeth. Time to hop into bed and have a good night.